it. How are you? Good. Listen, I, you know, I'm, it's lovely to be with you all. It was a wonderful um, first few, uh, the music was simply wonderful. You know, I, I, normally I would speak given the theme of, that you introduced about the wonder of culture, the, the fundamental lessons of anthropology, the sim simple notion that every culture is something to say, each deserves to be heard just as none has a monopoly on the route to the divine. You know, this idea that the other peoples of the world aren't failed attempts at being us, let alone failed attempts at being modern, that every culture by definition is a unique answer to that fundamental question, what does it mean to be human and alive? And when the peoples of the world answer that question, of course, they do so in the 7,000 voices of humanity. Uh, and those answers collectively become our human repertoire for dealing with the challenges that we'll all confront in the coming uh, centuries. Um, you know, the purpose of anthropology is to make the world safe for human differences. That's what Ruth Benedict said, the great student of Franz Boas. And certainly as a professor at UBC, I see my job as to try my best to infect young people with a virus of tolerance. And, uh, but on, on this particular session, I thought it might be more interesting to sort of step back thinking of those young people and addressing sort of fundamental notions of creativity. You know, often young people, as you suggested in your lead, you know, they'll come up to someone like me or David Suzuki or, or anyone, any elder that they, they respect and sort of be sort of almost intimidated by the biography of that individual. And my retort to that is always to say, of course, I have a more lengthy list of experiences. I'm, in my case, 66 years old. It makes perfect sense. Uh, just give yourself time. And parents, of course, are always asking me what will happen to my child who is studying the liberal arts? What will poetry do in their lives? And I always come back there with the story of a good friend of mine, Steve, who got a liberal arts education and didn't know what to do. So he went off to India where he lived in a cave for four years and he knew he was in trouble and he probably should come home when the local people started to bring him food and alms. And so he came back to America and of course he meditated for 65 days. And the fellow who was telling me that this story was driving me to the airport in Boulder, Colorado. And I asked the obvious question, well, what was the eureka moment? What did Steve realize in his meditation? And then this incredibly sort of conspiratorial whisper uh, his associate leaned over from the dry, from the from the steering wheel and whispered into my ear two words vegetable protein as if that would explain everything i had no idea what he was talking about but what steve had realized in his meditation was that the problem with soy milk wasn't the product, but the container that relegated it to the weird food section of your grocery store. So Steve took soy and milk and put them together and called it silk, had it marketed in milk cartons and insisted that the distributors put it in the refrigeration dairy section of grocery stores, even though soy milk doesn't need refrigeration. And four years later, Steve sold his company for $295 million. So that is a lesson that anyone who's lived a long and fruitful life will, will share with a young person. And that is simply that life is neither linear nor predictable. You know, I say to young people, a career is not something you put on a, like a coat. It's something that grows organically around you, uh, step by step, choice by choice. Nothing is beneath you unless you make it so. Nothing is a waste of time unless you see it that way. An elderly cab driver in Vancouver can easily have as much to teach you as a sadhu in the mountains of the Himalaya or a shaman in the Amazon or certainly a professor at a, at a university. And if you put yourself in the ways of opportunities uh, such that not, not in the sense of becoming an opportunist like a schemer, but simply putting yourself in the way of opportunities where there is no choice but success, you suddenly find yourself capable of achieving things that were beyond your, imagina your imaginings a, a few short months before. One of the biggest lessons I learned, and it took a long time to understand this, was that creativity isn't an abstract thing. Creativity isn't the motivation of action. It's a consequence of action. You can't be creative if you don't do. And so you, what you need to do is whatever you think needs to be done and only then ask whether it was possible or permissible. 
uh, pessimism is an indulgence, despair, an insult to the imagination, um, orthodoxy, the, the enemy of, of invention. Uh, you know, nature, I always say to young people, uh, loves courage. Jim Whitaker, the first American to summit Everest, uh, once told me that if you're not living on the edge when you're young, you're taking up too much space. And so what you have to do in life is kind of envision the impossible, dream the impossible, and you suddenly discover the world doesn't drag you down, it lifts you up. You jump off the cliff and you discover that you land not on rocks, but on a feather bed. And in a sense, this has always been the message of all the saints. And so many people, when they're young, are obsessed with finding a job. Well, I always urge them to be cautious because the word job in English is derived from the old French word gobert, meaning to devour. My father had a job all of his life. He called it the grind. And I used to imagine as a little boy that he came home every night just a little bit shorter. And indeed he did. And wh what I encourage people to do is to never have a job. I've never had a job in my life until I was recruited to UBC at the age of 59. And even then, I was fortunate enough to be able to establish my own terms for, for the position. But what I have done is work and, and work very hard and work has a more um, a nicer ring to it because it's derived from the uh, old uh, um, uh, Anglo-Saxon word um, meaning to create, to inspire. And so the lesson for young people is to never have a job but to work harder than anyone you will ever meet, and then things will come out well. Now, I remember when a, a time that many of us um, went through when we were in college or in high school, when we'd sort of gather around and, and, and everyone would be trying to guess what they were going to become in life. And, and, and I remember once at university, someone, someone there in our little circle said they're going to be a doctor, or someone else predicted a, a, um, a career in law. Uh, a friend of mine who had come into um, Harvard as a, a football player from Brooklyn and, and graduated as a Sufi poet, a uh, gay poet, in fact, um, uh, said that he was going to be a poet. That's what he predicted in his life. And it, it went around the circle and it came to me and I, I didn't know what to say. And I kind of blurted out that I was going to be a poem. And I wasn't being precious. It was just that um, it was inconceivable to me that you could find a single slot into which to plug an existence. It seemed to me that the work you did at any one point in time, the job you held, if you will, was just a lens um, through which to view and experience the world and only for a time. From the earliest age, I, I sensed that the goal um, was to make living itself, uh, the act of being alive one's vocation, knowing full well that nothing ultimately could be planned or anticipated, no, no blueprint found for something as complex as a human life. And I had those intuitions when I was 17 and 18, and, and they ring true to me now, almost uh, 40 or 50 years later. Uh, whatever limited creativity I've brought to bear in the world, whether it's in books or films and in creating a family or, or in, in, in any endeavor, um, everything has been spun into being by circumstance and serendipity. And it seems to me that always the, the key is to be uh, in a position to remain open to all new possibilities, free of, of constraint and, 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 and conventions. Um, now, for me, the most remarkable thing, perhaps, is that I was able to create anything at all. I mean, I grew up in the most simple of suburbs, the most bourgeois of backgrounds, um, in a commuting society, uh, world outside of, of Montreal, there was nothing around me that spoke of creativity. My parents were good and, and, and decent and incredibly ethically kind people, but there weren't any books really in our house. They didn't go to the films. They, there was never any intellectual discussion in the house. They were just good, decent um, people who, of course, imbued my sister and I with their remarkable values, which I would only come to appreciate later in life, particularly when I became a father myself. But in terms of sort of creativity, um, you know, I, 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 it may explain why I kind of 
embrace the adage of Baudelaire, you know, horror of home. I, I, I knew that I had to start to jump off cliffs or I was gonna, gonna die. But the, the one thing that did creep even into that somewhat sterile suburban neighborhood was music. And I'll never forget when I was 13 and I turned on my clock radio and heard the opening notes of uh, the John Lennon tune, A Day in the Life from Sergeant Pepper. And I will never forget this revelation of understanding as to just what words could do. And that in a sense was, was the very beginning. Now my parents, were extraordinarily generous, not only in spending half, not of their salaries, but half of their savings to send me to university, knowing full well that every day I spent in Cambridge widened the social gap between us. And that was an extraordinarily uh, generous um, thing for them to do. My father understood that he would not be the one who would inspire my life, and he was never in the slightest way jealous or envious of the men in whose shadow I would end up walking. Um, there was never any pressure from my family to be anything or do anything, only to achieve some level of excellence. And that kind of cast me into a void. And for 10 years of my life, even though on paper I was doing what in retrospect most people would say were remarkable things, um, and exciting things. I lived a life of quiet desperation and, and constant internal turmoil, so desperate to find my destiny. Not, not fame, not money, but I was desperate to know what would become of me. And my sister always says that that is something that people never appreciate in, in doing biographical sketches of me, was how tough I was. Tough not physically in the sense of bravado, but that I resisted the urge, the, de uh, the, the temptation to fall away into a bourgeois career that might have been so uh, comforting, but ultimately soul destroying. I'll tell you, there was a point when I was 23, when I was so desperate to know my destiny, that I applied to graduate school in botany and law school at the, as if they were the same thing. And I got into both. And I was saved by the fact that my sister, by chance, was articling at a posh law firm in Vancouver. And I went to pick her up one day, and there was behind the desk a radiant goddess, a, a fairy godmother, a 60 or 70 year old woman who took one look at me and said, are you Karen's brother, Wade? And I said, yes, ma'am. And you just came back from the Amazon. Uh-huh. And you eat all these weird plants. Uh-huh. And then she said, you follow me. And she dragged me by the hand and she walked me back through the law firm until we got to the library. And she had set up a ladder that lifted me off the ground until I came face to face with a lithograph from the 17th century of an English barrister, hooked nose, fat, the wig, the whole works. And she yelled up from beneath the ladder and, and said, is that you? And I took one look at this image and I said, no. And I walked down the ladder, walked to her front desk, called the law school, retracted my application, and I went off to study psychoactive plants at Harvard under the uh, direction of the great um, legendary botanist, Richard Evan Schultes. You know, I, I, I had become an opportunist. You know, Hemingway said that the most important preparation or credential to be a writer is to have something to say the world needs to hear. When I was young, I had no dreams or hopes of becoming a writer, but I desperately wanted to live an interesting life. And as Mark suggested, um, it began in the most crazy serendipitous way. In, in the late 60s, I used to fight forest fires, and it was a time when the fire camps were full of draft dodgers. And we were these obsequious, um, obedient Canadian lads, and these Americans would tell our bosses to piss off, and it was irresistibly charismatic. And one of them had the Life magazine with the Harvard student strike of 1969 on the cover. And in this atavistic way, I thought, well, that must be the college you go to to become cool like these Americans. And so I applied to Harvard, not even knowing where it was, got in, 
My parents didn't have the money to accompany me to Boston. I got to Logan Airport and it wasn't a suitcase, Mark. It was this massive steamer trunk of everything that I owned. And my family didn't have the money to take taxis. And so I dragged it through the subway station until getting to Harvard Square in 1970. And it was a caravansary of, the ma of madness. Harry Krishna, uh, SDS, the whole eruption of the social movements of that era. And then as Mark said, I realized my mom and dad had made a mistake. I had no money and the dorms weren't open for six or seven days and the banks were closed. So I dragged this trunk through the streets of Cambridge until I found the church. The pastor let me in, but he was a war resistor and his basement was full of weathermen about to escape to Canada. So I became totally radicalized, spent my first year at Harvard making the last university-wide student strike. And then the next day I had to determine what my academic destiny was. And I, with these images of shaman from the dioramas of the Peabody Museum, where I had just visited swirling in my head, I walked into the streets and I asked this friend of mine, Stuart, what he was gonna major in and he said, he said anthropology and like Forrest Gump, I said, what's that? And he said, well, you read about native people. And I said, well, that'll do. And, and I signed on as a student of anthropology. And then after a year and a half of studying uh, and reading about native people in books, I wanted to live with Indian people. And so I was in a cafe in Harvard Square with my roommate, David, who was also a rough cut diamond from the West, the only kid there with a pickup truck in Harvard Square. And there was a National Geographic map of the world right between us in this cafe, beside us in this cafe. And suddenly David looks to the map and he looks to me and he looks to the map and he points to the high Arctic. Well, I had to go somewhere. And I, my left arm lifted and it landed in the Northwest Amazon. Now, had it hit Italy, I might have become a Renaissance scholar, but having decided to go to the Amazon, there was only one man to see, the legendary Richard Evan Schultes, a man who shot blowguns in class and kept outside his door a bucket of peyote buttons available to the students as a, a, as a, a, a optional laboratory experiment. And I walked into the office, rapped on the door, and I got as far as saying, sir, I'm from British Columbia. Well, he thought I meant his beloved Colombia, and he was such an Anglophile that one of his uh, colleagues said the only way for Schultes to go native would be to go to London. And so that adjective caught his attention. And I said, I've saved up money in a logging camp. I want to go to the Amazon and collect plants like you did. Well, this was a man I was looking at who was the greatest Amazonian explorer of the 20th century, a man for whom mountains and national parks had been named the man that had sparked the psychedelic era with his discovery of the botanical identity of Tehuanacatl, the so-called magic mushrooms, and Oluluiki, the serpent vine, amongst the uh, Mazatec in Oaxaca in 1938. And when I asked him, I said, I want to go to South America and collect plants like you did. I had never studied botany. I had no idea about South America. And he just peered across a mound of plant specimens through his antiquated bifocals and said very simply, well, son, when do you want to go? And two weeks later, I was in the Amazon where I stayed for 15 months. The point is that that is the way a life unfolds, you know, not step by step in, in a kind of coordinated. I keep telling my daughters, you cannot scheme through life. You know, it, you know, I listen to that music. I was so touched because my daughter, my oldest daughter, Tara, it, it, she sings so beautifully. I mean, she's been on stage in front of 10,000 people with Carlos Vivas. The Grateful Dead wanted to record her. You know, it went, but it she's, it's, it's, she sings with sounds that you only hear in forests. But one day she came up to me when she was, you know, uh, thinking about life and said, Daddy, should I be a musician? And I instantly said, no, not because I didn't want her to be a musician. And she still is a musician. But I said to her, honey, if you have to ask that question, the answer has to be no, because no musician ever asks that question. They can't not sing. Jimi Hendrix never was without a guitar in his hand. I was a good, I'm a very good friend with the Grateful Dead, Bobby Weir. Bobby comes in to visit me. He can't walk by my wife's classical guitar without picking it up. He's not showing off. Jerry Garcia, he never was without a guitar. That's what a musician is. And I said that to my daughter. So you can't scheme your, your, way, your way through life. And so that, that's really how I, you know, I, I, I um, you know, one thing leads to another. I, um, uh, once when I was 20, on, on, I, I was asked over, overnight whether I was willing to guide an Englishman through 300 miles of swamp and rainforest separating Columbia from Panama City. 
at that point, I believe bliss was an objective state that you could achieve just by opening yourself unabashedly to the world. So I always had just one word in my vocabulary for any new experience, and that was yes. So of course, I, I said yes. And it was a horrendous passage. We were, we were chased by the law. We were lost for 10 days with no food. Uh, my companion was down to 126 pounds. I was down to 140 pounds. It became this big adventure. And um, he wrote this kind of, um, kind of bad book about it. But he was very kind to me. And, and, and he, he lifted entire passages from my journals into his book, which seemed like a fair exchange because because, you know, he needed some content because he didn't know anything much of anything. And I, I was able to see my words beside his in whole paragraphs. And I thought at that age, it's, if he can write a book, this, this, this eccentric Englishman, endearing as he is, so can I. And then I, I spent three years in the Amazon as a botanical explorer, and then something changed. I wanted something new. And there was always something waiting in the fourth floor Erie at that museum. And one day, Schultes just asked me randomly whether I was interested in going down to Haiti to infiltrate the secret societies and secure the formula of a drug used to make zombies. Well, naturally, I said yes, uh, thinking that it would consume maybe a fortnight of my life over a spring break. It had ended up consuming four years of my life because, because within 24 hours of arriving in Haiti, I experienced something that had eluded me in four years in the Amazon, and that was a window wide open to the mystic. And then that research, which became my PhD, was funded by an unknown benefactor. The intellectual backer was a man called Nathan Klein, who was the father of psychopharmacology. He was a legendary uh, 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 scientist. Uh, and the unknown backer was unknown. And yet if I needed $10,000 by Wednesday as a graduate student, I just had to call New York by Monday. Uh, and then suddenly I discovered that the unknown benefactor, he turned up one day and it was David Merrick, the Broadway producer, who was seen in this project, a film possibility. And then suddenly overnight, Nathan Klein died during routine heart surgery. And 48 hours later, the backer had uh, um, uh, a debilitating stroke. So I went from having no money, uh, from being flushed with money to having no money. And I walked off the street to a literary agent in London, introduced to me by that journalist who I'd walked through the Darien Gap with, and I walked out with a book advance, more money than I had ever even imagined, $35,000. It was so much money for, at that time in my life, I thought I had won the lottery. So the first thing I did is took my girlfriend at the time to Paris for a, a bunch of time, and when, with the money left over, I funded the research. And then I actually had to write a book. And I hadn't written anything but love letters and, and, and scientific papers. And I sent two chapters to Simon and Schuster that I thought was the best thing since the Bible, and they rejected it. So then I came back with hepatitis and malaria, uh, having had that incident where I lit myself on fire uh, that Mark referred to. And uh, I, I just had to teach myself to write. There was no choice. And so I got all my favorite books, Hemingway for Dialogue, Isaac Dennison for, uh, for Landscape, Lawrence Durrell for Atmosphere, Alejo uh, Carpentier, you name it, T.E. Lawrence, Seven Pillars of Wisdom with that great opening line, some of the evil in my tale may have been inherent in our circumstances. And I had a great story because I'd lived it. I just had to teach myself how to tell it. And in seven months, I taught myself how to write. The book was edited in a day and it sold 400,000 copies. So suddenly I was a writer. And the key thing in all of that is that I hadn't compromised. I had, in fact, been patient. I had, in fact, given my destiny time to find me. And that, that's what I always try to say to young people. You know, when I was young on those first journeys in South America, 20 years old, living where my hat fell, no plans really whatsoever, um, uh, enveloped by the warmth of the Colombian people, an old Kamsa shaman said to me something I've never forgotten. He said, he said, in the first years of your life, um, you live beneath the shadow of the past, uh, too young to know what to do. In your last years, you find that you're too old to understand the world coming at you from behind. In between, there is a small and narrow beam of light 
that illuminates your life. That's all you have, that little beam of light in which to create the full wonder of a unique human being. And the challenge in life, the ultimate creative challenge, is not the books you write, the songs you write, the, the performances you, you do, the business deals you cut. The ultimate creative challenge is to be the architect of your own life. And if you look back on a life that you have been the captain of the ship, if you, you've held the helm of the rudder, you've made every single choice. You may not have made the right choice always, but you owned all those choices. And that is the roadmap to contentment in old age. Bitterness invariably comes to those who look back on a long life of choices imposed upon them by the society, their families, their peers, or their own internal um, um, pressures and, 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 um, and lack of, 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 of fortitude in a sense. Um, so the, the, the greatest creative challenge, as I say, is to become the architect of your own life. And to do that, you cannot compromise and you have to give your destiny time to find you. And I'll just end this with one, um, one wonderful story that I think speaks to the fact that if you open your heart, if you live in, 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 in a kind of a loving state of compassion, and I don't mean to be precious by that, but people are always ask, asking me, how do, you, how do you break down the barrier in all the cultures you've lived with? It's never bravado, it's always love. It's always finding that gesture that creates commonality with you and the people with whom you're living as, 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 as a guest. Uh, it, it's a willingness to sleep where you're asked to sleep uh, upon the stony ground, to eat what's put in front of you, to self-deprecating humor, uh, a willingness to, to pitch in, all the things that we learn as basic good manners. And I think if you live that way, the world really does uh, reward you. I, I know that when I, when I got my PhD, uh, it, the, the book I wrote became a Hollywood movie. There was a tremendous sort of flurry of, of media interest from the National Enquirer to Time Magazine. The, 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 I kind of got inoculated by the toxicity of fame. You know, it's a good thing to have when you're young. And uh, uh, I, I decided to go back to a more academic career and I applied for a postdoc uh, at the New York Botanical Garden. I went through the very arduous process of application and I was lucky enough to be offered the job and I was too polite and Canadian to have asked at any point in the process what the salary was going to be. When I finally got around to that question, the fellow who was a friend of mine said, um, well, we, we think we can get you 19. And I had just gotten married. My wife was pregnant. I was going to live in New York City on $19,000. I had just made, you know, half a million dollars by writing a book. So I turned to the fellow and said, Mickey, I love you, but you just made a career choice for me. And that's when I decided to try to become an independent scholar, a kind of entrepreneur of knowledge. Everybody at the time, parents, peers, professors, said it was a professional suicide to make that choice, save for one man, this venerable, old, beautiful anthropologist, Johannes Wilbert at UCLA, who had been one of my great mentors. Johannes called me up, and remember now, I'm about 30 years old or so, and he said, Wade, you just do whatever you want, and I promise you, when you turn 59, a major research institution is going to call you up and offer you a full tenured university professorship just like that. Well, lo and behold, the year I turned 59, I got the call from UBC, offer me just that. And mercifully, Johannes was still on the, alive, and he was the first person I called, and I can still hear his German voice crackling on the phone line with glee because he had seen his prediction come true. And that's, in fact, what brought me back in 2014 to Vancouver. So I say finally to young people, never give up, never compromise, and give your destiny time to find you. Be patient, and it will come your way. Do you want to ask Wade your question? Hi, Dorothy. Um, yes. Um, when, when did you first realize that um, 
uh, that you had to give destiny uh, time to find you? You know, I, I think that, that, that um, in, in all of that little rap I just give, I don't want to give anybody the impression that I was somehow uh, 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 consciously or realized. I mean, in retrospect, I mean, the, the very fact that I applied to law school and graduate school in botany just suggests how completely messed up I was, right? Um, but the, in retrospect, the key thing for me and, and my good fortune was that even when I want, I was just not capable of compromising. I didn't know how to compromise. I don't mean compromising in, in, a, in terms of social interactions on a day-to-day -day basis. Of course, we all compromise all the time. But in terms of that, you know, even when I wanted to sort of take that, that safe route to law school or to medical school or whatever, you know, is, 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 is sort of um, uh, dangled before young people as, as, a, as, a, as an easy out, I just couldn't do it. I, I couldn't see myself. I couldn't see a single vocation that would be mine forever. You know, I mean, I, 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 uh, I just couldn't do it. So in a way, I, I was, I had no choice but to create my own vocation. You know, my own job. You know, my my own combination of things. And, um, and and I was able to acquire the skill sets along the way to do that. And again you know, I don't really believe in the creative process. That That is such a passive term in the same way that I don't believe in writer's block. I mean, can you imagine if a plumber came to your house and said, oh, and suddenly said, oh, I just can't do it this morning. I've, I've got plumber's block. You, you, you'd call the police, you know. Um, you know, writing is a craft. You get up in the morning and you do it. Um, public speaking is something you have to learn to do. I was very fortunate that I had a wonderful drama Shakespearean teacher a uh, former actor who would put a podium on the stage in high school and he'd put you left and right on stage and he'd yell a noun at you from the back of the hall. The minute you heard the word, you had to walk to the podium and give a five minute speech on that subject without a single um or ah in full theatrical kind of flourish. And that was just incredible training. Similarly with photography, you don't, you're not born a photographer, you have to learn. And the only way to learn is to watch and listen and study the masters. And I had a wonderful teacher who would just project images on the wall. And he, he left his classroom at Harvard mercifully full, free of idle chatter. And so all the other serious photographers who wanted to kind of pontificate about the images were quite irritated by the fact that he had no interest in their opinions. But I loved that because I had no opinion to give. I just wanted to absorb. And at the end of the year, I ended up having more photographs in the group show than anyone else, simply because not that I was better than they were, but because I had listened and, and absorbed, you know. So so I, I, I think it's, um, I was just lucky that I, I, I was not capable of compromise. I'm going to invite um, another member of the community, Juno Kim, who has a question for you. Hi, Wade. Thank you so much for uh, for sharing your wisdom and your journey with us. It was uh, very enlightening. Um, I just had a quick question um, regarding, I I'm wondering if ancient wisdom of any kind has shaped or played a role in your journey. Um, Buddhism, Taoism, Stoicism, or any of those? Oh, absolutely. I mean, you know, my wife is, a, is very much a practicing Buddhist. She has been doing with her Sangha throughout COVID from the very beginning, four hours a day of, of prayers and uh, meditations and so on, you know, and, and uh, in a way, I'm more of an academic Buddhist, but, but I, um, uh, I, I've, I've certainly found inspiration in the fundamental idea um, that the, the journey of life is not destination. It's not a destination. It's a state of mind. Um, you know, one of the one of the things that I learned very early from my father was he wasn't um, um, a, a, a religious man, but he believed in good and evil. And he would say, you know, there, there there's good and evil in the world. Pick your side and get on with it. You know, one of the mistakes we make in in Christian Judeo Christian thinking is we 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 think that somehow if we just try hard enough evil's going to be overcome you know we have this in the image of the christ child and the and the fallen archangel who becomes a devil and that whole clash becomes the essence of the christian ideology 
And, you know, and so when, for example, in, in, in medieval Europe, when, when Christian priests would ask the heretical question, if God's all powerful, why does he allow evil in the universe? They were burned at the stake. But in Eastern philosophy, when Lord Krishna was asked that same question by a disciple, if God's all powerful, why does he allow evil in the universe? Lord Krishna said to thicken the plot, because this is the whole point of life is that there's good and evil. The ones, neither one is ever going to disappear. And if you realize that, then you don't expect to win. You know, the problem when people become embittered, whether it's embittered about a career, embittered about a, a lost environmental battle, embittered by a personal loss of, of, of a loved one, it's because somehow we don't expect that to happen. And of course, in the Buddhist Dharma, the, 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 you know, the, the Four Noble Truths um, delineate a different map of the world. You know, all life is suffering. By that, the Buddha didn't mean that all life was negation. He just meant that bad things, evil happens, you know. The cause of suffering is ignorance. He didn't mean um, uh, uh, stupidity. He meant the, ten the cruel tendency or the tendency of human beings to cling to the cruel illusion of their own centrality in the stream of divine existence. But then, of course, the, the Buddha offered a way out. The third of the noble truths, the revelation that ignorance could be overcome. And then the fourth, the delineation of a contemplative practice that had followed guaranteed a transformation of the human heart. So that has always informed my life. It, life, is a, life is a path, not a, not a goal-driven um, uh, set of ambitions, you know? And so it's how you are in the moment that counts. And, 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 and that's why I say to young people that, you know, it really is true um, that money matters little in the end, but acts of loving kindness uh, uh, radiate through eternity. That's the lesson of the Dharma, the Bodhisattva idea. If only we could spread that lesson far and wide during these challenging days, but you are doing that right now. Um, Carol, can I ask you to unmute and join us uh, and share your question? Hi, Wade. Thank you so much for being here. Um, my question is, um, in those times when you found yourself in uncertainty, how did you get through those darker moments? You know, it, it's very, it, it was very difficult. I mean, I never, um, uh, you know, I, 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 I was blessed by guardian angels. I remember I had to, um, at one point, I, I, I had to make up some courses. I had worked in a logging camp in Haida Gwaii. I didn't know what to do, you know. I, I, um, I always found, I, you know, it's funny. I, I, you know, I graduated from Harvard. I was very precocious. I'd been two and a half years in the Amazon or, you know, I still, I was 23, I didn't know what I wanted to do with myself. I remember the only time my mother ever yelled at me was on the phone line when I, she said, well, what are, you, what are you gonna do now? And I said, I don't know. And she said, she screamed, you're 23 years old. It was like the witch of the North or whatever, you know? And uh, then I came back to Haida Gwaii where I was working. And then, you know, it was a time of all the hippies and everybody wanted to be mellow. And I'm the least mellow person in the world. The word mellow, by the way, means a state of overripe fruit. I don't know why anyone would wanna be mellow. Uh, I have so much energy and had more, so much energy. I was short circuiting. You know, I came close to self immolation. So I lied about my credentials and I got a job as a forestry engineer in, in one of the toughest logging camps. And then I, you know, I ended up going down to UBC and I had to make up some courses and I had a horrible relationship, uh, sadly, a lovely woman, but terrible. I hated living in Vancouver. I disliked the university. I was miserable. And I was going to fail um, chemistry, organic chemistry. And I went over to the health services before Christmas. And I just went to this doctor and I said, listen, you know, if I take this exam, I'm going to fail. It'll ruin my life. And he gave me, a, he, I don't know who he was, but he gave me a little note that got me off the hook. And that's why I do everything I can to get when kid, I get young people at the university all the time from not even my classes coming up to me and I, and, and for, for advice and help. And I, you know, I, I answer, I answer every email I get from a young person because you never know who that person may become. They, they could be an Einstein, a Darwin, be it man or woman, or it could be a young person desperately in need of a helping hand. You know, you just, 
that's your, your job. I get these wonderful emails from kids all around the world like, uh, dear professor, do you remember you said to follow your heart? Well, I did, and I'm living with a tribe in Australia. I've learned a language. I've been adopted. I'm never coming home. That was from a young UBC woman. Another time I got one saying, uh, I'm so glad you an answer all your emails because um, if you hadn't answered mine, I wouldn't be doing what I'm doing, and I'm walking around the world. I mean, you know, this is the, the job of a mentor is to sow seeds of hope. And that's certainly, you know, and one of the wonderful things about life is you get to the point where whether you know it or not, you become the mentor. I mean, Dennis McKenna and I always joke because we become sort of seen as these old men of the psychedelic movement. I mean, I haven't used psychedelics in years, but I've just lived long enough that my association with people like Schultes and Watson and Albert Hoffman and the things that I've written has sort of, you know, that's a marvelous thing. You know, what is life but a story you lose the power of comprehending as you get old and suddenly you find yourself you still think you're the starry-eyed young person but you're actually that person in an old person's body looking down at the starry-eyed young person which is sort of a wonderful thing and, and and i go back to this idea that nothing's a waste of time like that that year my my poor father he'd spent half of his savings to send me to harvard and what do i do with a degree i take a job at the lowest level of a logging camp for a year. But I'll tell you how that came back to, to help. During the 80s and 90s and the battles for Karmana and the battles for the forest, when, you know, when I first joined the Suzuki Foundation board and was very active with EcoTrust, and we were all trying to save the old growth, I was um, kind of ambushed on a TV show in Vancouver. And alongside me was Jack Monroe, the head of the IWA, the, the, the powerful union. And at the time, Jack was probably one of the most powerful individuals in the province, second perhaps only to the premier. And uh, Mr. Monroe was absolutely furious that he had been ambushed with this green squirt who was beside him on live TV in, 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 that was going to go out all over British Columbia. He was dripping with sweat of indignation. And just before we went to, the, to air, I leaned over to him and I said, you know, Mr. Monroe, I've always wanted the chance to thank you because your union put me through college. And he couldn't believe it. He said, well, what local, what TFL, you know, where did you log? And he suddenly realized, and then we went to air. And I proceeded to say exactly what I was going to say about the corruption in the forests of British Columbia, all of which he knew to be true, but he couldn't admit as head of the IWA. But before that interview was over, Mr. Monroe had his arm around my shoulder on TV saying, you know, I don't speak as well as this young man because I didn't get to go to college. But I'm telling you, this is the kind of young man my union makes for the province of British Columbia. And that was all because I'd spent that time in the bush and because I didn't see him as the enemy. I don't believe in enemies, only solutions. Wow. Um, do we have time for one more question? There are so many tremendously good questions. Can I, can I, can I invite one more person forward? Absolutely, Mark. Mark, I've got a little bit more time, by do the you, way. We can we do a couple. Okay, we'll do a couple more. So things around. I'm going to ask, I'm gonna ask uh, Kona if she would please um, turn her video and, and uh, audio on and come and join us. Claudine, are you there? I don't. Uh, I am here. I just. Uh, it won't allow me to start my video. Oh, there Hi I am. Her. Yay. Hi, Kona. Hi. Um, Hi, Wade. You actually have no idea what an amazing honor it is to actually be speaking to you. The young person in me that first came across your work and um, really uh, got but it really had it ingrained in her how important anthropology is, is screaming on the inside. Um, the question that I was wondering was, what are your current reflections of the moment? Um, 2020 has really challenged us all with this pandemic and with the global uprising for justice anchored in the Black Lives Matter movement. Um, and so I'm wondering, are there any lessons from outside of North American culture um, that you think that we could, we could consider for our toolkits as we try and work through what's well, happening? You know, I want to thank you for that question. It's so important. Obviously, I put a lot of my thoughts about COVID and its implications of into this Rolling Stone article, which you know has, has uh, uh, you know, it's it's gone totally viral. It's had over three hundred million social media impressions around the world. Five million people have oh. read it. Rolling Stone. I haven't seen that. 
Oh, you should check that out. I mean, it's had a, it's become a story of itself. I, I wrote it in an evening, sent it to my old friend, Jan Wenner, and it, it's called The Unraveling of America. And it looks at what COVID means. Um, and and it, it just hit a nerve around the world. But, you know, uh, back, back to your question. I mean, I think, um, you know, a lot of what's going on in America is, is uh, a, a, a whole cohort of individuals who feel that they've been left out and they have been left out, um, you know, and one of the things that's, you know, race is a story of America. The, the cardinal rule of American social policy historically is don't let anyone get below the blacks, right? And during the era of Jim Crow, the one thing poor whites in the South had going for them, which is why they became so vicious and vitriolic and so hateful, is at least they weren't black, right? That's all they had going for them, right? And, yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and and America will never heal this divide, a divide which Trump is not the cause of as much as a symptom of, uh, a consequence of, you know, he's, uh, in, until there's economic justice in America, where, and, and racial justice, and, and as Martin Luther King always understood and always spoke about, those things are one thing. You know, they're two, two, not even two sides of the same coin. And in a global sense, the, my great hope is that if you, in the long term, um, is that if you think of, in our lifetime, the two great stunning moments that will be spoken about 10,000 years from now. One happened when Apollo went around the dark side of the moon, and we saw on Christmas Eve 1968, for the first time, an earth rise, right? And we suddenly, everything shifted, everything shifted. And a wave of illumination went over the world. Women went from the kitchen to the boardroom, people of color from the woodshed to the White House, P uh, gay people from the closet to the altar. Children suddenly started spoke, speaking of Gaia, biodiversity. When I was a kid, just getting people to stop throwing garbage out of a car window was a great environmental victory. Now, 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 you know, now there's no place in the world without a ministry of the environment. The, the world has sh changed. But there's been an equally significant scientific revelation that also came about at the end of a long journey, but a journey not into space, but into the very fiber of our beings. And that is a fact that within the last generation, geneticists have proven it to be true what philosophers have always hoped to be true, that we're all brothers and sisters. And I don't mean that in the spirit of hippie ethnography. I mean, quite literally, studies of the human um, genome have left no doubt whatsoever that the genetic endowment of humanity is a continuum. We are all cut from the same genetic cloth. We are all descendants of the same handful of people who walked out of Africa um, uh, 65,000 years ago and embarked on this incredible journey that carried the human spirit in 40,000 mm -hmm. years, 2,500 generations to every corner of the world. Race is a total fiction, you know, and, and, and what we need to, uh, to achieve if this vision of the earth from space um, finally put the lie to a kind of a genesis driven notion of infinite uh, um, territory of an earth there for our taking, um, a kind of Descartian idea that a mountain can't be a deity, it's simply a pile of rock. You know, that's all shifting, but we're lagging behind in terms of our fundamental understanding of the absurdity of notions of race, right? And that that is the next frontier of human progress is when we finally, um, you know, and, 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 it, and, it, and it may seem like it's taken so long and it's so ridiculous. But remember, as I say to my students, you know, if you look back in the 19th century, all the certainties that were embraced as if they were uh, artifacts of nature, frozen in time, carved in stone, um, are now laughable. In, in, in the Oxford English Dictionary in 1911, there was not a word for racism. There was not a word for colonialism. There wasn't a word for homosexuality. The superiority of the white male was accepted with such assurance that there wasn't even a word for racism in the English language. And, 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 uh, and now, um, you know, what, when I say to young people, if you understand what 
a, 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 an African-American woman of, of mixed descent who knows that her ancestors were raped by overseers says that I am the statue of the Confederacy. If you understand what she means, if you understand it's completely normal for a person of one color of skin to, or, or to be in love with a person of another color of skin, if you understand that there's no such thing as a normal family, if you, if you, I could go on and on. If you understand these things, you are a child of anthropology. Because we have to remember that that these ideas, which were moved forward with social uh, um, protests, with, with uh, insights from artists and, and thinkers and so on, but the thing that absolutely challenged the artifice of the 19th century was this extraordinary brave cadre of, of anthropologists led by Franz Boas, who came along and said something that shattered the European mind, that every culture has something to say, that the world in which you were born is just one model of reality, that the other people aren't failed attempts at being you. you know, this is why anthropology is not an obscure academic discipline mm -hmm. as it has made itself. I mean, it's just mm -hmm. bizarre to me how activism has become a kind of embarrassment to anthropology when anthropology was born in activism. I mean, people mm -hmm. like Margaret Mead and Ruth Benedict and Zora Neale Hurston, these were the mm -hmm. great heroines of anthropology. They were hounded by the FBI. They were hounded by the society. They were denied academic positions because they were challenging the orthodoxy of the 19th century, the old kind of evolutionary notion that we went from the savage to the barbarian to the civilized to the strand of London, mm -hmm. that the only mm -hmm. measure of, 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 uh, of cultural advancement was, techno was technology, of which we naturally were, were you know, at the heap of the pile. So, so I, I think the next, the next the, 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 until America in particular and everywhere, um, comes to, to terms with race, racial justice, social justice, they go, they go hand in hand and, and economic justice. Um, and until America can heal that divide, um, I really uh, fear for its future. And, and, and uh, you know, the cult of the individual in America mitigates yeah. against that. Um, you know, and when Americans, when Americans, um, um, you know, deny the use of masks or they flock to conventions um, and beaches. They're not demonstrating courage or, or independence or freedom. They're revealing the weakness of the people who lack the stoicism to endure the pandemic or the fortitude to defeat it. And those, and those who decide, you know, right? I mean, America once celebrated um, um, freedom of expression as the core to democracy. Now the country ranks 45th in terms of press freedom, a country that once received and celebrated the huddled masses, even if immigrant groups had trouble, still the ideal was the huddled masses. Now more Americans favor building a wall across a border than welcoming in the desperate mothers and their children who are fleeing conflicts that were, were created by America's foreign policy in the 1980s and 1990s and by America's consumption of cocaine today in, board, in boardrooms and bars across the country. I maintain that those in favor of building a wall across the southern border are actually committing an act not of nationalism but of treason because they are betraying the very spirit upon which the, the country was founded. I mean a nation that defines individual freedom as the right to own a personal arsenal of weaponry uh, a, a, a freedom that is seen to trump the well-being of children with 346 young Americans killed in schools in the last decade. That's no freedom. Uh, and that's that, and that, and that, you know, and when, when, when Americans always say that, you know, social democracy is communism light. No, it's vibrant capitalism focused on the well-being of every tier of the society. When they say uh, in the States, it'll never take hold in uh, their country, um, you know, that may well be true, but if so, it's a stunning indictment and, and uh, evidence of the truth of the adage of Oscar Wilde when he said the United States was the only country to go from um, 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 barbarism to decadence without passing through civilization. Now, I say that all as, as an American. I'm an American and a Canadian and a Colombian and I'm Irish. I have four passports. I don't look forward to the end of America. I, I don't gloat and I certainly don't 
uh, think that the world will 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 be celebrating um, as the torch uh, and the hinge of history opens to the Asian century, particularly if that implies the dominance of the Chinese Communist Party with their treatment of ethnicities and with their treatment of the environment and their social contract for their own citizens and their suppression of democracy. But the bottom line is that the country of the states um, is unraveling at the moment. We are uh, now officially over time. <clears throat> this, uh, thank you, Kona, for that incredible question and uh, Wade for your answers. There are uh, a lot of questions. Um, I'm Wade, with your permission, I would like to share those questions with you and perhaps you and I can put our head together and think of a way to share some, some short form answers maybe on the Creative Mornings blog uh, um, and, um, and continue that conversation. I know one issue that I and I'm certain numerous folks um, listening can't help but think as you reflected just then, your answer and this moment seems very American centric, of course. And it is, and rightly so, and I'm, I'm not diminishing that in, in any way, but I, 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 I think it's important, and I, this maybe we don't have the time to go into it, but this is also a Canadian problem. There are deeply flawed systemic issues inside our own Eurocentric colonial fucked up country. I love being Canadian, uh, but when I hear all of this, America this, America that, and I do it, I, I'm guilty of it. Um, it's really difficult, I think. Well, you see, Mark, I'm not, I'm not singling out America. I, I'm, I'm, in speaking to Kona, I'm citing a specific piece that I wrote right. for Rolling Stone magazine. I'm not suggesting that Canada is a perfect place by any means. But the bottom line is we do have a social contract. Right. Uh, we do have a healthcare system that focuses on the collective, not the individual, and certainly not on the private investor who views every hospital bed as a, a rental property. The truth of the matter is on July 30th of this summer, when the Americans announced 59,967 new cases of COVID in all of the hospitals of British Columbia, there were five cases of COVID. So, right. so in, 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 in creating or presenting a critique of America, it doesn't imply that no one has more contempt for the reflexive uh, visceral uh, anti-Americanism that some, some Canadians seem to uh, a pander uh, to, yeah. uh, and and this is not to suggest for a moment, but the discussion in this case is not about Canada, it's right. about United States, right? right. And, and we can have all kinds of discussions about what we need to do to make Canada a better place, and we and those discussions are important. I mean, you know, if you if you if you note that you know African Americans are thirteen percent of the American population, yet make up the vast majority of of, of inmates in federal penitentiaries, we obviously can cite the same sort of statistics for First Nations people in our prison system, which is equally deplorable. There's a million things that we can do to improve Canada, but in terms of this moment with COVID, um, and and there are elements of our society that do work much better. Um, you know, universal health care is not about medicine. It's about sending a message that everybody matters. Um, our public schools are not funded in British Columbia by neighbor by by property taxes in neighborhoods which favor the children of affluent communities. Mm. Um, you know, our, our workers in places like a Safeway are still protected to some extent by unions. And so I'm not, I'm not in any way trying to suggest um, that, and in fact, some people who critique the uh, Rolling Stone piece said just that, well, you know, what about Canada? Well, that's kind of not really um, the, the point in a sense, you know, in, in terms of this one piece of writing about uh, 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 in Rolling Stone. The, the, right. the point is to look around the world and ask yourself, where is the tr where is the response to COVID working? And when you do that, you discover that it's not working in the States for a lot of reasons, and it is working in social democracies. And that is because we uh, don't define civilization um, uh, by the currency accumulated by the lucky few, but the wealth of a nation is a sense of social solidarity and bonds of reciprocity that at least attempt to bind everybody in a common purpose. And there is no question whatsoever that Canada has, has achieved a stronger sense of that than the United States of America.